Well, you know, it's been about 13 years since we came to Vancouver Island. And I remember the first little while that we were here. We arrived, what was it, dear? November, October 27th to the day, 13 years. Um, and where I, was, I remember driving down the road, and, and light and hope are always connected somehow for me. And I remember driving down the road in a great big 26-foot U-Haul trailer, pulling a trailer behind. My wife was behind us in the van with loaded right to the roof. And she was pulling my truck, or in my truck, and pulling the van loaded right to the roof on another trailer. So we had a lot of stuff. We should have downsized earlier. And it was a day like today. It was a beautiful day. The sun was shining. We had just come from Calgary. And the leaves on the trees here were still green. Well, they were still green in Calgary too, but they were frozen in place. <laughs> but we arrived and things didn't go very smoothly when we first arrived because the guy who was supposed to turn the house over to us was about, what, four hours late in cleaning out and getting rid of his stuff and so we could move our stuff in. So we finally got our stuff in and then the rain started. And it rained steady for weeks. I think we had five days of sunshine between the end of October and the beginning of March. And for those people that aren't used to it, we came from the prairies. It's sunny in the winter. It's cold as stink, but it's sunny. And some of us have seasonal affective disorder. I don't know if you're all familiar with that. It's where the dark days kind of get you down and depressed and you don't have a whole lot of hope because it's so dreary. And you know, I've gotten used to the rain. I, I actually enjoy the rain, as long as it's not horizontal. <laughs> but there was always hope that in the darkness that the sun would shine at some point. You know, December here on the coast is a, is a dark time because of the clouds, because of the rain, and because of the gloomy weather, people like us sometimes suffer a little bit of depression. But Christmas has been chosen. This is really not Jesus' birthday, for those of you who haven't figured that out yet, but it's a time where we celebrate his birthday because we need all the help we can get. <laughs> so, in addition to that, over the last two years, Christmas has been, you know, before the last two years, Christmas was a fun time. We'd get together, it was busy, we had, you know, office parties and we had family parties and we had get-togethers and reunions and all kinds of things and then COVID occurred and they decided they were going to lock us all up like we were prisoners and that added to the gloom and the despair and some people are still suffering from that some people have lost their businesses some people have lost their livelihoods some people have lost their homes it's still not over the effects of that are still here and more than ever I think people need hope Along, although the pre-Christmas COVID celebrations often led to excess, and I'm guilty of that myself, they dispelled some of the weather-related gloom. But unfortunately, too much food, too much drink often left with too many bills to pay after the holiday season ended. Some people could not celebrate because of financial hardships, family dynamics, or disabilities. So the celebrations and reunions most people take for granted made them feel even more deeply disconnected and deeply alone. And having worked in the funeral industry, I know that Christmas after Christmas is usually the busiest time of year. Now that's not all because of suicide, it's just that people sometimes just give up. They've had their Christmas party, they've met their family, they've done their thing and they're just, they're tired and they're, they're sick and they just want to go home. But there is hope for those. There is hope for all of us. And Christmas is a message of hope. And no one hopes for something that they don't want. No one hopes for something that they don't have. And no one hopes for something that they can't 
that they can't easily, that they can easily get themselves in their own strength and their own efforts. But it is wonderful that the birth of a Savior points us toward a bright, joy-filled future filled with hope and a joy-filled present filled with hope if we accept what we know about him. The traditional church calendar, as was mentioned, Advent, the four weeks before Christmas, is a time of fasting and prayer. And the purpose of Advent is to remind us that there was a waiting period before Jesus was born. And it, during that waiting period, the prophets had been silent for over 400 years. And the Jews were in a terrible state. They were under the oppression of the Romans. They had tax, you know, we talk about our tax burden today. But their lives weren't any better. The Romans taxed them unbelievably. Now, the Jews were waiting in the silence of the prophets for 400 years to be delivered by a Messiah, delivered as they thought from Roman occupation. Mary waited, pregnant, uncomfortable, riding on the back of a donkey all the way to Bethlehem because some fool in government decided that they wanted to have a census. But even that was God's plan. Jesus needed to be born in Bethlehem to fulfill a prophetic word from 400 years previous. The world's people also waited. They waited captive to sin and separated from God. They waited for their relationship with him to be restored. And if you were here last Sunday, you heard that that's not the only restoration that God had planned for us. He also planned to restore our relationships with each other. And You've been talking about, you know, what we need to do. And that's, that's part of that restoration. Our, our, our love for each other, our love for the lost, our love for the world in general, because each and every one of us is God's image. We are God's imagers on this earth. And so we need to love and respect and honor and care for each of those people that we come encountered to. Now over 2,000 years have gone by, and although the Messiah has come, and the Israelites are free. And people who accept Jesus as their savior are delivered from their sins through Christ's blood. We still wait. We wait for Jesus' return. We live in a broken world. And if you watch the news, you're reminded that wars occur, that people still die of disease, of malnutrition. Nations experience political upheaval. We still see wars happening. We still have an enemy who prowls around seeking to devour us. Some people lose hope that things will improve, but we as Christians need to live in hope because we have the greatest hope of all. We have the hope of eternal life standing before us and we have the Holy Spirit dwelling within us in the present to help us navigate these times, to navigate these days. We live in hope, expectantly awaiting Christ's return, wrapped in his grace, we wait. We wait with hope in our hearts because we know that one day every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. We hope because, as Paul wrote to the Ephesians in Ephesians 3.20, he is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine according to his power, which is at work in us. Can I get an amen for that? Amen. We hope in our hearts because we know that. We hope in our hearts because that we, we have a somewhat, a, a taste of that, we have a, a, a down payment of that. We lighted the candle, representing the hope for the returning Messiah and the hope that things will get better while we are still on this earth. So this year, let's approach the holidays differently. Rather than getting caught up in the countdown to Christmas, let's approach the Advent season focusing on something else 
Let's focus on Jesus himself. Let's focus on this week's message of hope. Let's capture the hope, the peace, the joy, and especially the love of that first Christmas season from over 2,000 years ago. Jesus is the reason for our hope. Let us mentally prepare for the Advent season and take steps in our own lives to grow in our hope and love for God. Let us prepare our hearts to have a fresh understanding and a deeper commitment, drawing nearer to God as we celebrate the birth of God's only begotten Son and celebrate not just Jesus' birth, but the deposit, down payment, or guarantee of eternal life present, represented by His Holy Spirit living in us. One of the most hope-filled passages that, that I can find is John 1, 1 to 5. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning, and through Him all things were made. Without Him nothing was made that has been made. In Him was life, and that life was the light of mankind, the light that shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. Somebody once said that the, the, the more defined the shadow, the clearer the light that has cast it. The more defined the shadow is, the brighter the light is that casts the shadow. We can't hope for a brighter light than Jesus himself. The lighting of the candle isn't passive. The lighting of the candle reminds us that we too are light, as Jesus said in Matthew 5, 14 to 16. You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden, neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before men, that we may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. That's a challenge for each of us. It's a challenge to each of us, that we need to do the things that God calls us to do, the works of love, because of what he has done for us, that people might be able to see who we really are, because frankly, in the media today, we're not portrayed very flatteringly. And it's only getting, seeming at least, to get worse. So what we need to do is we need to be better than that. We need to be better than our best, as it were, because we have the Holy Spirit who enables us to be better than our best. We need to be his best. We can shine a light in the dark places. We can say we will not let the darkness overcome the light. When we light the first Advent candle, we proclaim that good triumphs over evil, that all shall be redeemed, and we say that we are daughters and sons of a risen King, and that we choose hope. I invite you to join on this journey toward Christmas. And on the way there, let's sing with the angels, glory to God in the highest and on earth, to men of goodwill, may his favor rest. Let's run like the shepherds to those who need to hear the message of peace and reconciliation. And like the wise men, let's bring our gifts of hope to people still captive in darkness, desperate, trapped in addiction or other circumstances beyond their control. Let us bring Jesus our gifts in whatever form they take, whether it's providing food for the hungry, shelter for those shivering in the cold, or visiting someone who is sick, or stopping to listen to the story of a young man in A&W wearing rollerblades on his feet and a tinfoil hat on his head. I gotta tell you this story, this was so cool. 
Patricia and I decided to go out for lunch yesterday. And we, we decided to have coupons because I'm really a cheap guy. And, and the place where we were going was not the usual a and we go to. It was uh, the one off, off the highway. And I walked in the door and there was a young man sitting there and he had tinfoil on his head and down his nose. And he had rollerblades on. And the minute I walked in the door, I noticed him. It's hard to miss a guy like that. And I could feel the Spirit of God saying to me, you need to talk to this guy. So I had my burger. And I asked Patricia, I said, you got some time? I, I think I'm supposed to go talk to this young fellow. So I went and I sat down in front of him and I introduced myself and shook his hand. I said, so how long have you been in the Comox Valley? And he told me he'd been here since September. He's looking for work and he can't find work. He's got skills. He hasn't got a place to live. He wasn't asking for money. He never once asked for money. He just needed somebody to talk to. And as I'm talking to him, I discover that he believes in Jesus. He hasn't got a home. He hasn't got two nickels to rub together, but he believes in Jesus. And he's a little bit out there, a little bit paranoid, which you, you get that way when you've been beat up on the street a few years. And I got to pray with him and I got to, to talk with him. And it was one of the greatest things. And in the end, I actually did give him some money but that wasn't what he wanted. He said, no, I don't want that. I want a job. And in my experience with people on the streets, a lot of them, not, I don't know whether it's a majority or not, but a lot of them will, will take a handout, but they won't take work. They're waiting for their check to come. This guy was different. He wants to work. And if I had any way to find him a job, I would. So you never know what's going to happen along the road. So bring your gifts, providing food, providing shelter. And as you bring them to those people, you're actually bringing them to Jesus. Thanks, David. We already know that. And I have a gift that I want to share with all of you. I am a some people call me an author, some people call me a writer, some people call me an idiot, but that's all right too. <laughs> They're probably the most right. And this poem came to me last Christmas and I'd like to read it for you now. This is my gift to Jesus, to you. How strange, the one who had such power, so holy, the one with angels to command should set aside his heavenly glory and cloak that power in feeble infant hands. How strange the mighty life that time and life began begins on earth like every other man. How strange that true hope has its start in a tiny frail human heart. How strange the, sun, the one who set the sun ablaze now shivers naked in a stall, depends on rags to keep him warm. Though king of heaven and lord of all, he slumbers in a virgin's arms. How strange, with might and splendor set aside, he walked the earth with human stride his perfect life poured out to save and rescue poor souls from the grave. How strange this humble divinity, this Jesus should offer us eternity. I hope you found my offering of words worthy. I hope he found my offering of words worthy and I hope you are blessed by them. And I too say, Maranatha, come Lord Jesus. Hope of the nations. Thank you. Let's pray.
Father God, show us where we need to be and what we need to do. I've often, I confess that I've often envied those that have visions and can stand up and do vision dumps in front of the congregation. I don't have visions. I have little niggling thoughts in the back of my head. Go here, do this, say that. I thank you for those. We're all different, Lord. We all have different gifts. We all have different abilities. And I thank you for each gift, each ability, and each person represented here today. And I ask that you pour your spirit on them abundantly, that they might be able to be empowered and encouraged to do the things that you have called them to do. Today, tomorrow, next week, next month, next year, until you return. In this I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks, Ken.